Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Mary, and I'm alcoholic, recovered alcoholic. Um, grateful to be sober and to be here with you all tonight. Can you hear me okay? Okay, perfect. To set the tone to be loud and proud in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, My sobriety date is November 11th, 1989. um, And I have a sponsor and my sponsor has a sponsor and I sponsor a bunch of great women. A few of them are on the screen tonight and are in the meeting and God bless them. And um, you know, I have a home group, uh, um, just just for now group in Boca Raton, Florida. And um, I come from the Pacific Northwest. And I mean, I'm just going to start this out by saying, I don't know the like the last few hours. Um, I've just really felt like a lot of emotion has come up around this topic. And um, it's just you know, just things that God's been stirring in my heart. And, um, and it's just kind of been like flashes of areas of my life where God has given me the ability and it's only by his grace and it's only by his mercy that I can even get to a place of forgiveness. And, um, and so it just has been, I don't know, God just took me on a little bit of a sentimental journey, not a morbid reflection journey. Um, and because we can say that, you know, we can look back at places our, of our life and have regrets and have um, <clears throat> sadness about things and, and all that. And that's our human condition. And, um, and what I know today is that... Um, I can honestly tell you I'm 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 61 years old. I've been sober for 31 years. Um there's been tremendous heartaches in my life, but there's also been extreme joys. And I think that we all um we all get to have that stuff in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. We're overcomers, you know. We've um overcome this hopeless state of mind and body. And, you know, a woman was talking earlier about emotional sobriety and and I don't have to stay in those dark places. I don't have to stay in those places that um that I can just look back on some of these events of my life and go, thank you, God. You know, and every every part of my journey has been a part of what God's made me to who I am today. And I don't you know, we don't know what's necessary. And I've heard people say this, you know, I don't know what's bad is necessarily bad and what's good is necessarily good. God uses like Peter's sponsor's wife, Marie, says, you know, God uses absolutely everything. And I have found that to be true in my recovery. I found that to be true in my walk with God, that um, our book even says that the dark corners of our past, you know, the dark things of our past become our greatest asset. And I can't tell you that the kid of spiritual tools that I happen to have in mind, that the big book is laid out for me, that my sponsor is my sponsors over the years have laid out for me have ended up being things that have become tremendous assets to help another drunk, to help another drunk. You know, um, my friend Carla says as alcoholics, we're the only ones who can tell each other that, you know, the deepest, darkest things of our past past and, or Peter says that, you know, deepest, dark, darkest things of our lives. And, and we say, here's my number, give me a call. Or my friend Carla, who says, you know, alcoholics are the only people that can come together for the first time and reminisce, you know, and that's what we do, you know, our shared brokenness, that identification, one drunk to another. And that's what I love about Alcoholics Anonymous, no matter how much broken and or how you know there's times when i get to be the one that somebody leans on and there's times where i need to be leaning on somebody else and i don't care whether you got a day or you got 30 years or whatever that is that you know this shared
shared brokenness that we get to share together. And, um, you know, my journey over the years, I, I was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest in Bellingham, Washington, a little south of Vancouver, BC. I see a woman from Vancouver, BC. Um, it's a little town between Seattle and Vancouver, BC, the Pacific Northwest. And, um, you know, my little town was, um, was known back in the 70s for having more hippies per capita than any city in the United States in the Guinness Book of World Records. And, you know, it was a little college town and we wore Birkenstocks and socks and smoked green stuff. And, you know, that that that's it, man. It's mountains, it's rivers, it's hiking, it's biking. And, you know, in the middle of winter, you know, and um, I learned to enjoy one of my greatest joys in life and still is today an acronym for God is that is the great outdoors. There's nothing like the fresh air and the trees and the rivers and the mountains. And, and it's something I, I believe that God's put as evidence of his glory and his, his love for us is the, the beautiful love of nature. And I learned that growing up. My dad was a fisherman and, and a taxi driver and a construction worker. And, you know, my mom was, born and raised in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. And, and um, you know, she wasn't raised really well up there. There's a lot of alcoholism and, and that's how I was raised. And, you know, my dad lost his, his father when he was six years old and, and, um, and raising us family of six kids, you know, three boys and three girls was my father working hard to provide for us. That's what he learned to do. You know, he had an eighth grade education and he worked construction and he, and he fished in the summers in Alaska. And, um, and, you know, there was a lot of in those, oh my God, I'm going to cry. And the reminiscing of of things today that were on my heart, you know, this journey with God is, you know, there was a lot of, and it's like, you know, when you hear my story tonight, as I talk about forgiveness, um, I'm a, I'm a big believer and except when to do so would injure them or others. One of the things that I live with is, um, you know, as I journeyed through the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and as I journeyed through the steps and as I journeyed through, you know, outside help like our book talks about, I have learned and I have grown and I've forgiven by God's grace. And I can tell you that um, what I used to not like about my mother who passed away in 1987, by the way, um, are things I cherish about her today. You know, I was, I was the third Marion in my family. My mom had a great aunt Marion who was a very strong woman in Alaska. And, um, and my mom was Marion named after my great aunt Marion. And I used to be, you know, I'm named after my mother. And I used to despise the fact that I was Marion the third, which my great aunt Marion called me Marion the turd. I hated that, you know, <laughs> and, and, and now I, you know, and that's God and that's forgiveness. You know, there was a lot of neglect. There was abuse in our family and there was alcoholism and there was, you know, there was shame. You know, I wore shame like a heavy coat. You know, I wore it like a heavy coat as a little girl. You know, pe people weren't coming to our house. You know, there was the little girls with the bows and the ribbons and the dolls. And that wasn't how it was in my house. You know, my, my place was, you know, don't let people know where you live. Don't let them come to your house. God knows what it's going to be happening in my house. But I can tell you by the grace of God and the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 steps and that big word forgiveness, I wouldn't change any of it. You know, my mother, my sponsor tells me this and she, when Polly P is my sponsor and 
She's a wonderful woman in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the things she does when she starts working with us, before she even talks about our story, she says, tell me about your mom and dad, you know? And, um, and um, I couldn't be prouder than to be little Marion today. You know, I, I love that name and I love being that. And that's, you know, if you're new to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, um, underneath every single bit of that, you know, we had six kids in our family. We had three boys and we had three girls underneath all of that. My mom was loving and kind and she adopted another kid and brought him in. We couldn't even afford the six we had, but she brought in another one, a little lost runt. And, you know, that's something I repeated in my life. You know, when my kids were growing up, when they came, they came from broken homes and I'd take them into my house in, in recovery and my son's doing the same thing and my daughter's doing the same thing and my other son does the same thing. We bring in the misfits, you know, <laughs> we do. And, um, and and that's a beautiful thing I learned from my mom. And and um and you know my dad was gone and he would be gone during the summer. And I remember, you know, I was listening to a speaker one. It wasn't an AA speaker, but someone saying, "When is your first recollection of of praying to God?" And I remember laying in my bed as a little girl and. My dad worked construction, and this construction shirt must have been, I don't even know. But I, when he was gone in the summer, I'd put on dad's T-shirt and go to bed in it because I missed him so much. And I remember laying in bed and praying, you know, and because um, that smell, it made me feel close to him. And, and just wearing that shirt made me feel close to him because I missed my dad. And, you know, they say a lot of that stuff you know, when, when dad would be drinking the first part of the month, he'd be drinking hard booze. And my mom would always say that's dad's mean juice. And at the end of the month, when we were getting poor, dad would switch to beer and things would get a little more gentle, you know, but I can tell you that my dad was a world war II veteran and he had calloused hands and calloused feet and my, my fiance, my wonderful partner, Peter, you know, he talks about chopping wood and carrying water. And we had a wood burning stove and my dad chopped wood and he carried water. You know, he did. Um, his name was dude Weston and he uh, got that name in world war two. Oh my God. I'm going to be a sap- sappy sentimental journey tonight. But I hope my sappy, sentimental journey takes you to a place where we, um, you know, I just, I just don't know how to be anything but me. And and there, there's another piece in that too. You know, in that life of growing up as a little girl, I was always comparing myself to other people before alcohol even hit my lips. You know, I, I had these girls I went to school with and they were twins and they were, they loved God and they were raised in church and they had bikes and bows and Barbies and all this stuff. And they had God, man, and they had God. And I was always like, yeah, I come from the drunk home. So obviously I'm not good enough for God. And it was always trying to measure myself up to that, measure myself up to comparing myself to, oh, this is what the God girls are like. And this is what I'm like. And, you know, in that journey that speaker was talking about one night, um, and she was talking the early recollection of God, I remember working at this restaurant with these twin girls, and um, and I, I used to wait tables, and I was 18 years old, and I was working in this restaurant with them, and um and one of those God girls was working one night, one day. And um, there was this little old lady that would come in every day and she'd sit in my section during the lunch hour, during the lunch rush, and she'd get a cup of coffee and she'd sit there and just have a cup of coffee during lunch and leave 25 cents on the table. Well, I'm 18 years old and I'm trying to make a living and I'm kind of ticked. 
It's like, this has taken this table in my section. And I remember coming back one day behind the counter and that God girl was behind the counter. And, um, and she, and I said, man, that little old lady comes in, gets her cup of coffee and sits in my section and leaves 25 cents. And that the God girl said, well, She's so, so lonely. Isn't it good? She's got somewhere to go. And in that moment, like I, I know it sounds weird, but maybe not, but I had that compassion inside of me. There was a connection. When she said that, I was like, oh my God, you're right. And it changed my point of view in that. But I, there was like this conscious thought of that's in me, you know, and it, what does that have to do with forgiveness? Just a little piece of comparison of I'm not like that and I am like that or whatever, you know? And so um, I'm going to breathe and take a drink. <laughs> so, so anyhow, I take my first drink at 15. At 18, I'm at 18, I'm, I go to this party and I see this angry guy and he's getting in a fight with somebody, but he's really good looking. And I look at him and it's like love at first sight. And, um, and he's just angry, you know, but somehow I thought that was great. And, you know, like a lot of people say living life forward and understanding it backwards what I had, what I realize now today is I'd found somebody else to fix because my job in my family with my brothers and sisters was to fix dad. I could sing or I could dance to make dad calm down and not be upset with mom. You know, I could get mom calmed down and I could do all that stuff, you know? And, um, and so I'm off to the races with this guy. I get pregnant. I have three kids in a row and, and we have all of our children together, you know, stair step children and, you know, the first two 15 months apart and then the last two 16 months apart. And, um, and in 1986, I got pregnant with my fourth child. And my little girl was four years old. My, my son was five, my other son was five and my other son was six. And, and what I was doing as a mom very clearly was I was busy trying to give them the life I never had of all things, you know, the house that I grew up in this destructed house that I had, um, <clears throat> was my mom had gotten very sick from cancer and, and we, my husband and I took over the house and, um, because it had wood heat, she had emphysema and cancer. She couldn't breathe in the wood smoke and we needed to get her in a safer place. And, um, in that we, you know, immediately built a tree house, built a sandbox, got a trampoline. We bought a swimming pool and, you know, I was busy being that alcoholic housewife. I was busy trying to provide for my children better than I'd been provided for. But when all the while inside I have the spiritual malady and I have this, you know, drinking every night and putting the kids to bed so I can drink and being hung over in the morning and yelling and screaming at them. And, you know, a, a wonderful friend in AA, a woman named Donna H used to say that, you know, she loved and cherished and abused and neglect her children. And I was doing that same thing to my children. And all I could ever see was what I was giving them on the outside, you know, and I'm not talking about the kind of abuse that we can go to jail for, but I'm talking about the kind of abuse that we can do verbally. And I'm talking about the kind of abuse that we can do when we neglect our children, you know? And, um, and so I have this fourth child and, um, and we were really excited. The other three had been stair steps close together in age. And, and I get, I, I have this baby, uh, October 19th, 1986. And three months later, I had gone back to work at a grocery store and, um, 
to have insurance to cover my family. And three months and three days after Brian was born, January 22nd, 1987, my little sister had been babysitting him and she went in the bedroom to pick him up and came running out and he was purple and he was, he had died in her bedroom and he had died a crib death. And um, we had run to the hospital and handed him off to the nurse and she handed him back to me and said that he was dead. And, um, and the reason that's important for me to say is because it's always important for me to say, because I feel like in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I get to, um, my son, Brian has, has a memory that lives on in my life, you know, and, um, And from that place, my husband got sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker in his disease. And I got sicker in my disease. And what I found at 27 years old was that I couldn't care for my children. I was so stricken with grief. And later on that same year in August, my mom died. And, um, um, It took me a year and a half after that where I had gone to a therapist and I had gone to, you know, I'm trying to get sober. I'm putting every form of alcohol in my body that I can find. And my husband's not showing up to to take care of us or be at home. And and he's really um, neglectful and abusive. And um And I don't share that in depth. I don't share that in depth in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't. And I believe that for me, it's really important for me to, when things are taped and things are live, you know, to share that stuff in a very general way. There's a lot of hurt that happened, that hurt that happened to me, a lot of hurt that happened to my children. And, um, And the man never did find the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. He would do it for pieces of time and it was always just to appease me and to um um it was never from a place of brokenness and humility and the place that we have to get for ourselves in Alcoholics Anonymous I found the rooms of AA um my little sister got sober first in my family she got sober in 1988 I got sober November 11th 1989 and um but I stayed in that marriage a really long time. I stayed in that marriage till I was 15 years sober. And um, what had happened is I had gotten a lot of spiritual pride in my life. I found a God of my understanding through my children and through, um, you know, our big book talks where we see where religious people are right. And I found a God of my understanding in, in October 1988 a year before I got sober and it was through sending my children like God using everything. It was from sending my children on a Sunday school bus to a little Baptist church on Sunday mornings. Well, for an alcoholic housewife to, to have your children taken to church on a Sunday morning from nine to one, it's a pretty good hangover thing to do, you know? And, um, And so I find this God of my understanding, but it took another year and a half for me to get sober. And so I often say this, a head full of AA and a belly full of booze doesn't mix. And I also say that a heart full of God and a belly full of booze don't mix because I would go home and I would drink and I would wake up with those hideous four horsemen every single time. And, um, and so So finally, a year and a half later, after finding this God of my understanding, um, my little brother um, who lived under a bridge told me, he said, one of these days, you'll take a good, long, hard look in the mirror. You know, an ominous warning. I had gone to a therapist because all I thought was I was crazy from all this grief and loss and I'm drinking and I'm drinking and I'm drinking. And this woman tells me, um, this therapist tells me, that Marion, when you lose a child, you lose your future. And when you lose a parent, you lose your past. You're having trouble living in today. And um, 
And all those those were ominous warnings for me, like Bill talks about in on on his story. And um and so to fast forward my life, um, I'm 15 years in the program and um and I'm having my shiny God life, we being a worship leader in a church and and living kind of a double life. I'm living in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous sharing open-heartedly with my AA friends what's going on with me and with my sponsor and what's going on at home, but not really showing, sharing the depth of that, not sharing the depth of, of what was happening at home. And, um, and it was coming up on my wedding anniversary and my children were throwing a party and, um, and this is a you know a lot of stories to share in a general way and um and what had happened was uh i had started seeing a, a therapist to help me through the stuff i was broken i was um i was scared and i was beat you know beat emotionally down to nothing at 15 years of sobriety and if you believe that people can't be that way they can <laughs> You know, um, I was untreated. I was untreated alcoholic. I was full of a hundred forms of fear, like our big book talks about. And, um, and I wasn't honest. And, um, so I found myself in this place at 15 years sober where I hit an emotional bottom in my marriage. And um, and there was a lot, there was a lot of stuff that happened where it came down to a restraining order. It came down to a, um, it came down to um, leaving and getting away. And it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, in a place where my church didn't understand me, my AAs did. The beautiful women in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous who rallied around me and the people that worked with me that rallied around me. And um, But what had happened to me was... I see, I came to this place and this is a, in, um, a woman brought me to this place the, uh, a few months ago and there's a place in our 12 and 12 that talks about this self-righteous anger also can be very enjoyable in a perverse way. We can actually take satisfaction from the fact that many people annoy us for it brings a comfortable feeling of superiority. Gossip barbed with our anger is a polite form of murder by character assassination. It has its satisfaction for us too. Here we are not trying to help those we criticize. We're trying to proclaim our own righteousness. And I found myself at this place in 15 years of sobriety where my workplace, the man couldn't be around. In my AA place, he couldn't be around. But I had rallied around around me all these people with this justifiable anger. And I was actually using it, you know, as this platform, I've got, you know, the church had turned their back on me and they supported him. I had my, um, you know, my work people that were rallying behind me and I had my AA people that were rallying behind me. And, um, and it was like a year long thing. It was a year long process for me. And what had happened was I came into See, I had the same home group for 20 years. It was the Northwest Group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Bellingham, Washington. And I had people there that knew me and held me and loved me. And we cried many tears together. And we we had a beautiful, I love that place for the rest of my life. Those people were my people, you know, UAAs. And I came in one day, so broken, and I sat, we had these church benches against the wall. And I sat myself against the wall. 
and I just fell on the bench. I mean, I fell on the bench and I said, I'm going to have to forgive him. Because see, that unforgiveness was killing me. It was killing me. I had this self-righteous anger. I had this thing in me where, where I, it almost like protected me in some ways. But I found forgiveness and I found this place. And I, and I can tell you, there were two places I went in the big book that saved me. That saved me. Going through the steps again and going through, you know, steps one, two, three, and, and four. But um, two prayers I used that literally saved my life in that time was our sick man's prayer on 66 and 67. That says, we turn back to our list where it held the key to our our future. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see the world and its people really dominated us. And, and, and this anger I was holding on to had dominated me at 15 years sober. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, had power to actually kill. Had the power to actually kill. That unforgiveness had the power to actually kill me. That's what I came face to face with. And um, and I know today that forgiveness for us towards anyone, justifiable anger, the dubious luxury of normal people, resentment has the power to kill, is our number one offender. I can't afford that luxury. Today at 31 years sobriety over and over again, you know, I've gone through seasons of my life of unforgiveness. But um Especially in the place I am today at 31 years of, of, of here as I sit with you today is that um, inventory and unforgiveness and being in any, any place of unforgiveness in my life. I can't be in that place. I can't live in that place. So how could we escape? We saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how could we not wish them away any more than alcohol? You know, I can say with my lips all day long, I forgave. I can give you stories of, holy crap, if you're my friend, you're going to want to defend him and beat him up too, you know, or whatever, you know. But this is it. This was our course. We realized that the people who had wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. See, he wasn't a bad man. He was a sick man. Those that even those words right there were they perhaps spiritually sick, just like me, though we don't like their symptoms and way they disturbed us. They like ourselves were sick, too. We help God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity and patience that we could cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended us, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will not those be done, thine be done. And, you know, there's many ways we do this. We go through inventory and we do this stuff, right? But this is some of the practices that I had to use in my life. We avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. This is a line that saved me because I wanted to reach out and help him and say, oh, you poor sick man. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least well, God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. And then another place, I know we use the first 164 pages of the big books. These personal stories are important to us too. And um, on page 552 on freedom from bondage. See, what I had to do in that situation is apply to this, and I use this with the girls I sponsor. Um, he said, in effect, if you have a resentment you want to be free of, if you will pray for that person or the thing you resent, you will be free. You will be free. If you will ask in prayer for everything you want for yourself to be given to them, you will be free. See, first what I had to pray for, for the first thing I had to pray for, because I was looking at this and I'm not even willing to pray. The first thing I had to do was be to pray for the willingness to pray. That was the first step for me. I don't want to. I don't want to. 
And so first I had to pray for willingness. And then once I prayed for willingness, I became willing. God opened the door for me to be willing. See, just like I have no, I get no credit for my sobriety. I get no credit for the actions I take today to get to a place of forgiveness. I get no credit for defects of character being removed from me. I get no credit. I know for me that the only the powerful, which was one our book that talks about the flimsy read being the almighty powerful hand of God. God may, gave me a flimsy read. Okay, now you're willing to pray. And then I began to pray. If you will ask in prayer for everything you want for yourself to be given to them, you will be free. As for their health, their prosperity, their happiness, and you will be free. Even when you don't really want it for them. I love that line. I didn't want it. Even if you don't really want it for them. And your prayers are only words and you don't mean it. Go ahead and do it anyway. Do it every day for two weeks and you will find you have come to mean it and to want it for them. And you will realize that where you used to feel bitterness, resentment, and hatred, you now feel compassionate, understanding, and love. And the deal is this, you know, we have, we have a wonderful man in the rooms of AA, Sandy B, that's gone to the big meeting in the sky. And holy God, that man has the talk of talks and the heart of hearts on forgiveness. Of, and I've, I know so many of us have heard the stories on the tapes of the forgiveness he had to give for, for someone that, that had done the horrendous thing, the worst act to his daughter, you know. And, and um, he immediately went there. You know, he immediately knew he had to forgive. And, and I can tell you when I did this, when I did this prayer, when I applied the sick man, when I can look at this man as not bad man, but when I could look at him as sick man, when I could look at, um, at the fact that, that I would be free, you know, this woman, um, that I listened to talks about the most selfish act we can do is to forgive. That's selfish. It's a selfish act that we can do to get to that place. Why? Because, because it's going to bring healing to me. And when I did this, it was a selfish act. And it's selfish in a good way, okay? Not every form of being selfish is bad, right? But I needed to heal that place in my heart. Because ultimately, if resentment's my number one offender, if it has the power to kill me, you know, if it blocks me from the sunlight of the spirit, you know, I'm talking about God, I'm worshiping God in the church, and I'm being little Miss Christian Marion. But if I'm walking around with unforgiveness in my heart, then I'm separated from God. Then I've got, you know, that thing I read you in the 12 and 12 earlier, you know, just months ago, I, I had a, you know, some inventory I'd written and rewritten and, and um, some people that had offended me. And I was in this place of just jammed up in this justifiable anger. And it was making me, you know, whatever, written inventory, sharing inventory, written inventory, sharing inventory. And somehow it had just kept me hooked. It had just kept me hooked. And some of it happened to have come from a little bit in my sponsorship family where nothing wrong with them. This was my dilemma. It was my thing, you know? And um, I had taken the inventory to my sponsor and I just, I just needed to, I just needed an outside voice. And I had gone to a woman I love and I cherish her and I adore her. And I was just like, I take this inventory to her. I take this inventory to her. And, um, and she points me to that paragraph. She goes, well, I want you to read step six and seven in the 12 and 12. And what had popped out to me was those exact words that are written on page 667. See, what had happened when I shared that inventory with her, I was quite sure what she was going to tell me is, Hey girl, I'm on your side. They really are a bunch of schmucks, you know? And, um, and what does she do? She points to six and seven for me. And it was like, whoa, 
you know, I thought she was going to rally alongside of me and go, okay, Marion, I'm with you. They really do. You know, that sucks or whatever. But literally the deal that I've learned on my journey in Alcoholics Anonymous, if, if I write some inventory and if I have unforgiveness, I have this person I read, Thomas Merton, and he says that it's not selfish of me to live a life that pleases me, but it is selfish of me to expect you to live a life that pleases me. And I had gotten wrapped up in other people's stuff. So I was brought back to this place, gossip barbed with our anger, a feeling of superiority, because that's what I was doing. I was feeling like super sober Marion, comparing my life to other people. Um, Here, we're not trying to help those we criticize. We're trying to proclaim our own self-righteousness. And that's the things I was doing. You know, no matter how much someone can wrong me, no matter how much wrong I can do to somebody else. And that's the flip side of the coin. Us alcoholics, we want to look at how the world and players have, have wronged us. But what about the flip side of the coin? What about the flip side of getting down to eight and nine? What about that flip side of, of the forgiveness that I need to be given? You know, when it comes down to making our amends and making things right in the world, you know, um, the way I've wronged other people, because as alcoholics, it's not all about us and how the world has wronged us. It's like what I've done wrong to In our 11th step prayer and talking about, you know, to forgive rather than to be forgiven. You know, I had a situation with a young lady a little while back and, and I, and I heard her, I heard her emotionally and, and went through inventory and, and, um, and here's the deal. Those direct amends that we get to, you know, the exact nature of our wrongs, And the way I've hurt somebody and being able to forgive them to the exact extent that I hurt them, you know, uh, a a grumbling or a mumbling of I'm sorry just isn't enough anymore, you know. I know that today. Um. That inventory and getting right with God and getting right with me gets me right with you. And in these times we're living in, you know, um, you know, I just, about a month and a half ago, I, I walked through this little pandemic that we, that's out there in the world. And, and I got a little bit, I got pretty physically sick and I knew that my recovery had to do with God had showed me that it had to do with body, mind, and spirit. And, um, I know for me to have any conscious separation from God, to walk in any unforgiveness, to walk in any place like that, man, I got to be clean. I got to be clean in my heart and my soul and in my spirit, you know, the, um, the, uh, our inventory, my inventory, you know, we can look at it. Who wants to write inventory and who wants to, you know, who wants to do that stuff. But the deal is I should You know, I heard Peter's teacher, Mark 8, say this. We should be running to that. We should be running to it. 
I can't afford the conscious separation from this God of my understanding. You know, at 31 years sober, I, I know I've said that a few times. It's not the greatest amount of anybody on the planet. I'm sorry that I repeat that a few times. But, you know, I'm, I'm driving down the road one day and I'm restless and irritable and discontent. And a little bit of a thought comes to me like, what if you ever, what if, what if that obsession was ever on me again? That's, you know, this isn't a deal I get to take for granted. This isn't a deal that I have a daily repeat reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. How am I doing today? How am I doing? How did I wake up this morning and do my prayer and meditation? How did I walk through this day today without selfishness, dishonesty, and fear? How did I walk through this day um, you know, I, I I haven't been the greatest inventory writer in the world. You know, I can look at, oh, yeah, I prayed about it and it went away. You know, no, I got to write that stuff and I got to be free of that stuff because I can't afford this conscious separation from God. That's just not where I can be today. And um, so. So anyway. um. Was there anything else I wanted to say? I think right now, um, I just want to wrap this up in a place where, it's also in a place where, I hope you don't take that wrong, is that when you hear, that forgiveness is a selfish act. It's selfish in the way that, um, that we need to do, you know, they told me in, in the early days of sobriety that I own this chair. You know, I own my chair in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous taught me to look myself in the eye and know that I was no better than anybody else, but I am certainly no less than anybody else. And that's a beautiful place to walk today. Because if I'm running from me and I'm running from my problems and I'm running away from me, man, that, that line to thine own self be true is a powerful, powerful line. And um, guys, um, I just um, am honored and thrilled to be here tonight. and. Um, And I pray for the newcomers that you stick around and and um, live in this place of forgiveness for yourself, man. Dude, they would tell me back in the day, nobody be and you know nobody beats me up the way I do. <laughs> you know, nobody does. And um, that's what I have to share tonight. God bless you all, and thank you so much for having me tonight. Thanks. Wow, thank you so much, Marion. I'm Kevin. I'm an alcoholic. Me and Matt had me and Matt had to do the little switcheroo here. Um, so, uh, oh, I can, I'm I'm looking through the gallery and there's a couple there's a couple wet faces and I, I can I can see that your higher power came through you and you guys touched some souls here tonight. So uh, enough out of me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, it's been a real honor and a real pleasure to sit here and listen to what's happened here tonight. So, uh, so what's how this, how we're going to, uh, how we're going to try to do this. <laughs> we're now at the question and answer portion of this. Uh, we're going to do this till about eight 30. Um, so we're at the raised hand portion of the meeting. You can, uh, you can raise your hand on any device that Kevin, you yeah, Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, can go I ahead. add something? Absolutely. Yeah, go right ahead. What I realize is that I didn't get to the end of that story on forgiveness and oh, what I can tell absolutely. you. Go ahead. We oh my God. How did I do that? Um, thank you for letting me do that. Um, double dipping. Um, I drove down the road one day and I'd been practicing that prayer. And what I had realized is that had been removed from me. And I had been put in a place of, of, neutrality, safe and protected. And I know that what God had given me was a gift of forgiveness. Because to me, 
what I know is that I can't muster that stuff up myself. God had done for me what I couldn't do for myself. And um, so use those prayers and connect with him. That's what I wanted to say, Kevin. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.